from University College London. Um, I'm a research fellow here and I, I also run our immersive virtual reality lab. Um, the theme for today's seminar is cognition, um, not an expertise of mine, but um, I'm going to talk um, on this theme and how it relates to our work here at the lab at UCL. Um, when I was thinking about doing this talk, I was forced to think about how we define the term cognition. It's a, it's a, I'm not a psychologist by training. Um, I have some interest in, in aspects of psychology and visual psychophysics. So to me, the word cognition seems quite all-encompassing. It takes in all aspects of our information processing capacity. And it's, uh, to me, it's what just transforms sensory information into some sort of meaningful high-level constructs in our mind. Um, so this slide shows pretty much how I view it. Don't really know what it is, but I have some ideas. This black box approach, we have lots of sensory input, and out of this, we, we put some meaning in the world. Um, so this is a, an extremely complex and multifaceted process, and uh, certainly more than could be packed into a short seminar, and certainly beyond my expertise. So, uh, so I'm saying I'm going to present how the term cognition is a useful concept for our work here at UCL VR Lab. And in that respect, I'm going to discuss two types of cognition, um, spatial cognition and social cognition. And uh, I will discuss these concepts in relation to how they are constructed and understood in immersive virtual reality. So by spatial cognition, I mean the sorts of processes that allow us to understand the three-dimensional spatial layout of the world around us, being able to judge distance and size, or to reach out and pick up an object, or uh, avoid an oncoming car. Um, on the other hand, social cognition is uh, an altogether more subtle process. Uh, and it's involved in our responses and behavior to social situations. So examples of this would be maintaining our social space, um, how we use our eye movements and eye contact in conversation, turn taking, um, how we read body language as welcoming or hostile or excluding or any, any kind of thing like that. In fact, Many of these are the type of cues that are entirely absent when delivering a presentation like this. I'm talking to a screen. I have no idea what you are all doing. Um, so that's an, an overview of some of the themes I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm happy to take questions or comments during the seminar or at the end. Um, please don't let the lack of social cues deter you. Um, so. Back to spatial cognition, um, and what I'm showing you here is our cave at UCL without anything in it. Um, and I want to do this to illustrate that when we're constructing a virtual environment, we're using a, a set of tools to fool the participant in the environment into experiencing an environment that is not really there. So the image here is our immersive VR setup with no projections, um, nothing there apart from blank projection surfaces. Um, once we get our graphics cluster doing some work and switching on all our kit, um, we now have something to experience. So in this case, the participant standing in a fairly simple model of a kitchen, um, the environment's displayed on the four screens, the three back projected vertical walls and the front projected floor. Um, the images are displayed in stereo. Um, the viewer wears shutter glasses. Uh, they also wear a head tracker, which maintains correct perspective. Um, and this is all fairly standard kit for a cave. Um, 
some of the more observant of you might notice that for the, the purposes of this photograph, we've actually rendered all the images in, in mono without any stereo, so there's no disparity. Um, and the perspective is not correct for the viewer. In fact, the perspective has been fixed to be more or less correct for the camera. Um, but that, that's not important. What, what's important here is that we have an empty room uh, onto which we're applying four image streams in order to provide an illusory spatial percept. Um, the participant knows full well that they're standing in a the laboratory. They've probably even seen it as it was on the left when they came in, um, an empty room with blank walls. So we don't expect that people will believe that the simulated environment um, is real. We don't expect this guy on the right to be really thinking, I'm actually standing in a kitchen. Um, but what we do aim for is that our simulation is sufficiently good that people will act and behave as if this environment is real. Um, so an example of acting and behaving as, as if it's real might be that they walk around the furniture instead of through it. They perfectly well can walk through the furniture, even though it appears to project in 3D out into the middle of the room. Um, there isn't actually anything there. Um, they might try to sit down in one of the chairs. Quite a, or a, a, more, a more common thing, uh, something that quite often happens in our cave, is that people just walk straight into the screens. They forget they're there. Um, they forget about the real physical constraints of the lab and they start to experience only the space of the simulated environment. So in one respect, this is a very positive outcome. One of our goals in creating the virtual environment simulation is that people should lose awareness of the technology uh, that supports the illusions. Uh, and they should forget that they're wearing stereo glasses and a head tracker and surrounded by screens and so on. So um, what I'm interested in is what are the tools that support this illusion. So what we have are, first of all, a, a high frame rate image stream. So the image refresh rate uh, for, for the environment is 100 frames a second. These are from nice high contrast DLP projectors. Now the update rate of the simulation might be slower than this. You know, depending on the scene complexity and the lighting, um, the graphics update rate might be well be much slower than 100 frames per second. We normally aim for at least 25 frames a second, um, but we find that some types of simulation. So, for example, we've been doing some work with driving simulation recently, uh, where there's a lot of very rapid visual motion. Uh, you really need higher frame rates than this. Um, but uh, normally 25 is sufficient. Um, we need low latency and rapid update tracking. So our tracking system we use uh, updates at 200 hertz, so it's a, an even higher rate than the image stream. Um, but the latency is also a crucial element. So the, the latency is the, the overall time taken from the tracking sensor moving in the environment to the effect of that movement, i.e. the new perspective image being displayed on the screens. So even if you have very high update rate, quality is still not going to be good if the latency is too high. Um, if the user moves their head and the environment takes some perceptible time to catch up with their new perspective, this, uh, this will greatly diminish the spatial illusion. And uh, yeah, in ex extreme cases of this, extreme cases of tracking not running fast enough or running with too high a latency, uh, you get disorientation in, in the, the user and uh, possibly nausea. Um, it's actually quite hard to, to measure the latency in your system. This is something we put quite a lot of effort into. Our, our best estimate um, is we have an end-to-end -end latency of 60, 70 milliseconds. That's just to kind of put a number on the, the kind of numbers we're looking at. Um, and to give you a, a sort of benchmark, if you have an image update rate of 25 hertz, you're looking at a minimum latency of 
40 milliseconds because it's taking that long to draw each frame. Um, next thing that's important here is stereopsis. So we get an awful lot of 3D information from the changes in perspective and parallax that are afforded by having head tracking. Just small movements to the head tell you a lot about the 3D environment. But an additional source of 3D information comes from uh, stereo disparity. So I'm sure the concepts here are very familiar to everybody. Left and right eyes each see a slightly different view of the environment because there's a spatial separation between the eyes. So all in all, the, the type of spatial illusion we can create in an immersive VR setting like this uh, can be very compelling. Um, but it still lacks some of the visual cues that we would normally find in a real world situation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these. Um, the most obvious one is false occlusions. Um, this is something that you get in caves that you don't get with head mounted displays. Um, and it's because you can see your own body or you can see anything else that you happen to bring into the cave with you. Um, we might at some point try to reach behind a virtual object. And when we do this, so if you think about the man in the kitchen, you might try and reach under the table. Um, and when he does this, he might be surprised that his arm is not occluded by the table as it should be. Um, and that the 3D depth illusion for the object has started to strangely break down. Now this happens, of course, because the whole 3D environment is rendered on the flat screens. Um, and it's the stereopsis that's tricking us into thinking the objects are closer than the depth of the screen. Um, a slightly more subtle consequence of this is what we call the accommodation vergence issue or conflict. Um, what happens here, uh, the slide for this, um, if we look at an object that is very close to us, um, I'm talking in the real world here, then our eyes converge towards that object so that our eyes are both looking at the same thing. You can, you can try this yourself, you just put your finger in front of your nose and try and look at it. Um, your eyes converge together, so they're both looking at the same thing. Um, at the same time as this, um, your eyes are also going to change their focus uh, to focus on the close object by adjusting the shape of their lenses. Um, on the other hand, if we're looking at an object that's very far away, our eyes point straight ahead, and they will also adjust their focus to the distant object. So normally, in the real world, um, our focus, which is also referred to as accommodation, it works in, in tandem with convergence. Uh, there's like a mapping between them. So in other words, a given convergence angle will correspond to a particular depth, which in turn implies a given accommodation. Um, in phys physiological terms, there, we have small muscles um, around the lens of our eyes called the ciliary muscles, and they will compress and contract to give the lens an appropriate shape. So when I say that accommodation and convergence work in tandem, they're not physiologically linked. So while it's normal for there to be a, a correspondence or a one-to-one -one mapping between accommodation and convergence, there's no causality between them. So we can take advantage of this with our virtual environments um, by eliciting accommodation convergence mappings that are outside of this normal mapping. And this is what allows stereopsis to work in practice. So what we're all we're doing in virtual reality is simulating for the convergence because we're not able to do anything about the, the accommodation. We're always going to be focusing at the depth of the screen, whatever that is. Um, so the depth that we focus constant and the, the actual display is, is uh, um, at a relatively constant di distance in a cave. Um, you might think, so what? If people don't notice this issue, why is it of perceptual significance? Well, in, in a cave it becomes that because if we let a real object enter our field of view, so for example we reach out to touch an object that we see in front of us, we're going to get a 
perceptual dissonance. We can see if we reach out with our hand to touch a virtual object, then we will be able to see both our real hand and the virtual object, and they will appear to be at the same depth. Yet for some reason, we can't focus on both of them at the same time, because one of them, we need to focus at screen depth, and our hand, we need to focus quite close up. Um, let me talk now about uh, haptics in spatial cognition. Um, so up to now, we've been considering only the role of um, visual stimuli in spatial cognition. Um, but there are other sensory modes available to us. And if we implement them appropriately, these can strengthen the illusion of space and enable different types of interaction to take place. Um, haptics in itself is quite unusual as a sensory channel um, in that it's not really something that's moderated by a single sensory apparatus. If we think about our eyes and our ears, we think about you know, fairly uniform types of cell for detecting sound or light. Um, but with haptics, we really have a whole host of sensory mechanisms that enable us to experience a range of what we call haptic sensation. So these can be tactile, um, force feedback, um, proprioception, you know, the feelings we have in our, our muscles and our joints, uh, or even temperature. Um, haptics also distinguishes itself from the other sensory modalities in that it's what we call an active sensory channel. So it's possible to both receive and sense force feedback from the environment at the same time as we exert force on the environment. So unlike vision, audio, where these are passive sense and senses, um, there is light, we perceive it, or there is sound and we perceive it. With haptics, we can actually uh, influence the environment and exert force at the same time as we experience it. Um, of this wide variety of sensory mechanisms I talk about. At UCL, we've only ever used force feedback interfaces in a variety of settings. Uh, what these interfaces allow the user to experience is the solidity and the weight of virtual objects um, and the associated proprioceptive sensations that go along with this. So in this slide, we have a pair of um, crab arms um, from, from Parkro. Uh, these uh, work in a, a fairly similar way to other armature devices, um, but they're on a large scale. So these were specifically designed to allow the full range of the user's arm movements inside the cave. They have a, a working volume of, I forget, I forget the numbers, but say um, about a meter and a half by 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters. Um, in virtual reality simulation, um, haptics is it's it's hard to do, but uh, uh, we do it because it's often very useful. It's often used for skills training, particular in medical or dental fields. Um, an important factor in the success or the failure of training simulators lies in their ability to recreate the appropriate sensory feedback for the task that the user is learning. So if sensory feedback isn't correct, then users of a training system will learn how to perform the simulation perhaps, but they will not necessarily learn how to perform the actual task. Uh, so it's important, um, it's important to get this right. It's important that the, the task is well represented um, another important decision to make when designing a haptic simulation is whether the interaction should be what we call co-located or offset. Um, I mean, they describe these terms. So with uh, a co-located in interface, um, we're talking about the simulation of sensory modes in the same place. Uh, so for visual haptic co-location, it would be the case that when we reach out and our hand comes into contact with a virtual object, um, 
that is when we will receive some haptic feedback, feel the solidity of it or feel the weight of it. So we're touching the object where we see it, uh, there visually and haptically at the same place. Um, and this is opposed to a non-co-located interface, which I'll, I'll describe in the, in the next slide. Um, there's a difficulty with visual haptic co-location, uh, and that's in this implementation, because to do this, you need to very precisely align the haptic and the visual coordinate systems. Uh, now, you have a visual coordinate system in a cave that is in turn dependent on both the tracking coordinate system um, and the and also on the alignment of your projectors. So any small errors or non-linearities in the visual coordinate system, and we're talking of the order of you know, millimeters here, are not normally perceptually noticeable or significant on their own. If you're in a cave and the tracking system has some non-linearities, chances are you're not going to notice it. Um, However, when you couple this system, uh, couple this visual coordinate space to the haptic coordinate space, uh, we require a much higher degree of accuracy than this. Um, and this is because it's very important that when the haptic force uh, that you experience when touching a solid object has to occur precisely when you see the contact made. So in the in the image there, if you can imagine if your finger goes slightly into the object before the contact is felt, or if you, conversely, if you start to feel contact when your finger is not actually quite in contact with the object, then the, the, the experience is diminished. Um, the, the easier alternative to visual haptic co-location is to use visual markers to represent haptic contact points. Uh, this is what we call non-co-located haptics. So uh, in this case, you offset the contact point. You have a visual marker, in this case, a little red star. Um, and as you move the haptic interface, the star moves at a constant offset. And when the visual marker comes into contact with a, an object, that's when you feel the, the haptic force. Um, now, because these markers are rendered by the same graphic system as the, the the virtual environment and all the objects in the virtual environment. The spatial correspondence guaranteed. You know, it will, it's never going to be the case that the visual marker is offset from the object's edge or goes slightly into it. Um, so you, you're always going to get a, a, a correct uh, haptic output in that sense. Um, in theory. The spatial offset from the, the haptic effector to the virtual marker should be constant. But if there are non-linearities, you will get small changes of the order of millimeters, perhaps, and this won't be noticed. Um, uh, this, this is on the proviso that your offset is large enough, of course, that your spatial offset between the, the visual marker and the, the haptic effector. So um, for many many applications, this type of non-co-located interface will work well, and the users will adjust quite rapidly to the, to the built-in offset. It can be a little bit strange at first, but uh, you, 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 you come around to being able to use it quite easily. But um, for some other types of application, the offset just becomes an impediment to interaction, because you have this mismatch between proprioceptive and visual depth cues, and it, it just doesn't quite work properly. Um, an example of this, and uh, this is partly our motivation for, for studying co-location a bit more, was a, a project we did in the cave uh, several years ago now um, called PureForm. Um, and then the PureForm project was the, the implementation of a, a virtual reality system where participants could interact with digital models of sculpture through the sense of touch. So. Um, you can see in the image, the, the haptic device here was an, an exoskeleton, um, weight compensated for the arm, and it had two end effectors, one for the thumb and one for the forefinger. Um, the system was designed for co-located feedback, but initially 
our initial implementation was a, a non-co-located system using visual markers, just like I described to you. Um, and it was when we tried to move from the, the non-co-located setup to a co-located setup that we realized quite how difficult this would be to achieve in a cave environment. And it was only through quite a long drawn out calibration process with quite a lot of trial and error that we were able to achieve uh, a satisfactory co-located setup. Um, there is of course another issue with visual haptic co-location and this is the accommodation virgins issue mentioned previously. So even if you've got very, very precise co-location, you are still going to encounter the problem that you're reaching out, you're touching the sculpture, that you are unable to focus on the sculpture and your and your hand at the same time. Um, I'm going to move on from haptics to um, navigation and, and wayfinding. Uh, so this is another strand of work that we've been involved in. Um, so, um, I will come to explain the, the diagram in the slide in a moment. Um, the, the creation of a, a, you know, a compelling spatial illusion, the, the slide we showed before of the kitchen or of the environment with the sculpture, anything like that, any environment that you put in a cave really, to be able to, the, the spatial illusion is something that takes hold very, very quickly. So the whole process of people stepping in, donning the shutter glasses and the tracker, um, within seconds, they might walk into the wall. So the, the, the spatial illusions can be very compelling, very powerful, and take hold very quickly. It's also quite well understood. Um, and uh, some applications of this are becoming more commonplace now. Um, but our interaction methods in these environments are not always well designed. Um, and this is a, a, a fruitful area for research. Um, and in particular, navigation and wayfinding can be difficult to achieve well. And the, the, the big problem here is that your real movement in a cave environment is limited to the physical space within the screens. So at UCL, we have a three meter by three meter floor, and that's, that's all the space that you can walk about in no matter how big your environment, your virtual environment is. So navigation tends to be moderated by wand or joystick devices um, that allow users to fly and turn virtually. Um, another limitation we have is that most caves, kind of classic design cave, including our own, um, do not completely enclose the user. So we have a gap above us, we have no ceiling, and we also have an open space at the back. So if somebody is standing at the center of the cave, they have 270 degree horizontal field of view around them, but there is still a 90 degree gap at the back, and that's what's uh, illustrated here. Um, so the problem here is that while we want users to be able to move freely within the cave, especially in wayfinding tasks, we also want to avoid the situation where they're facing towards the open back section of the cave, because there's there's no display here and the, the whole illusion of the virtual environment rapidly disappears when you start facing that direction. Um, one means of avoiding this problem that we've successfully used is a, a technique called redirected walking. Um, and this is a a piece of research we did did here again is a, a number of years ago. Um, with redirected walking, um, the idea is that no matter what direction the user is facing, we're going to try and get them to face the middle of the center screen. So in, in this slide, the front wall, we're going to no matter if they're facing to the left, we're going to try and make them face towards the front wall. And the the way we're going to do this is by rotating the virtual environment such that the direction they're facing is rotated towards the, the front wall or the center screen. It uh, all sounds trivially easy. Um, 
So here's an, an illustration. In the image, you can see uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the user represented as an arrow in the center of the cave. And they're facing towards some object that's of interest to them. And that's represented by the circle to the left. And what we do is automatically rotate the, the virtual environment. So the user is now facing towards the front wall, i.e. as far away from the open back wall as possible. Um, what is important here is that the user should never be aware of this rotation. So it has to be performed slowly, and it can only perform, be performed at all if the user is also moving, if they are walking in place or, uh, or they're turning. This is when we can um, do the rotation. If they're standing still, then they will notice even a small rotation, because then you, you know when you're standing still. Um, so obviously, this is a very dynamic process. The user might constantly be changing the direction they're facing, and there's nothing at all to physically stop them from facing the back wall. But if we carefully calibrate this process, you know, not too fast, not too slow, only do it when they're moving, um, you can greatly reduce the likelihood of this occurring. Um, we, when we first implemented redirected walking in the cave here, we, we did some user studies, um, and we did them with this environment, uh, which is a, a long, oblong room. So what we asked each participant to do was to visit several signs in this room. And then uh, you can see this, you can see the signs, they're the, the yellow markers on the wall. And they were down both sides of the room. Um, and once they visited each sign, these signs would have words on them, we would ask them to go and revisit them all in alphabetical order. I forget exactly what it was. But what this essentially made them do is they would zigzag up the room, first of all, and then they would walk in all sorts of disordered ways to revisit them in alphabetical order. Um, it was something that was specifically designed that they would walk around and there would be many quite substantial changes of direction. And uh, with an appropriately tuned algorithm, most participants did not notice the rotation of the environment. Um, so although they thought they were following straight line paths to each of the target signs, they were in fact walking in curved paths. Um, when the task was completed, quite a few of the participants uh, became confused. We would often ask them to draw the environment they'd just been in, and they were unable to draw as a rectangle because they couldn't understand how it could have been a rectangle. Um, and some of them were confused that because they were quite adamant they had never seen the back wall of the cave, but couldn't understand how they, they didn't. Um, some people thought that we'd added another screen while they weren't looking. Um, so redirected walking is a, a, a useful technique, and we've actually applied it successfully in, in a few other cave applications. Um, I'm looking at time here. And uh, I think it's time to move on from spatial cognition to uh, social cognition. Um, I appear to have a blank slide here. Um, okay, so um, we've oh, David, performed. Can you hear me? Um, there yes. Is I, I'll say. I, I get one question about redirected walking. How did they move? Did they use an interface, a joystick or something? Okay. What we did, okay. What we did is we actually um, we uh, uh, in the cave we had a, a one tracker, the kind that we normally use for joystick navigation, and we put it, we strapped it to a backpack. I think it was actually a bum bag, um, so that they were waiting behind them. And it was used just to the track their torso, the orientation of their torso. Um, um, sorry, I'm getting some echoes back here. Um, and uh, we had a, a fairly simple 
walking detection algorithm. So from the tracking of this, we could tell when they were walking and what we were asking them to do was to walk in place. So walking in places where instead of moving forwards, you just lift your feet up and down and try and stay in the same place. So this was, this was how they moved through the environment. Um, this is possibly the, the most difficult part of redirected walking is that you're still asking people to walk. Now, walking in place is not a, a perfect solution to this because, of course, when people are engaged by the spatial illusion, they actually find it hard to walk in place. You're asking them to walk in place with respect to the physical lab, but if they're no longer aware of the physical lab, they won't necessarily stay in place, and often people will creep forward and end up in the, in the corners of the cave. But uh, in spite of this, the, the, the algorithm worked very well. So uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, did they get motion sick or not? No, they did not. They did not. No, they did not. They did not. We, did, we did run the standard simulator sickness questionnaires um, with this study because we thought this might be an issue, but uh, no, it wasn't something right. that happened. Thank you. Um, so, moving on to social cognition, um, we've done quite a lot of work looking at development of virtual characters and social interaction for many years now, um, and this has become an area not only for studying how social interaction can occur in virtual environments, but uh, more recently, and I hope I have time to get onto this, um, we've used this to study how people might respond to real situ social situations uh, based on how they behave in virtual ones. Um, so some of the research questions that we consider are things like, um, how do we create characters that allow social cognition to take place? Um, and this is, whatever we mean by social cognition, it's, it's a bit of a, a placeholder there. Um, I hope to flesh that out a little bit. Um, why is this important? Um, I suppose this is always a valid question in research. Um, and what aspects and characteristics of the virtual character are important to allow rich social interaction to take place? So. Um, in the time that I've been in this area, there have been enormous advances in the software and graphics hardware. Um, and these have allowed you know, enormous improvements in the level of visual realism of the virtual characters we use in, in so many ways. Um, but what is important to understand, there's much more than uh, having visually realistic characters to social interaction. Um, and I, I can illustrate that by looking at uh, this. Uh, I think this is going to be the oldest study I refer to here. This is about 11, possibly 12 years ago. Um, we did a study called Feed of Public Speaking. Now, in this study, participants were asked to prepare a short five minute speech on any topic that interested them. And then they had to present their speech in the cave uh, in a virtual seminar room um, populated by a virtual audience of eight to ten people. And um, you can tell how old this is because there's an overhead projector in the, in the environment uh, that, that dates it somewhat. Um, so the audience we had was programmed to behave in one of three ways. They could either be extremely enthusiastic where they, you know, they listened intently, they smiled, they broke out in spontaneous applause. Um, they could be kind of neutral audience, so they would maintain a normal amount of eye contact, but they, they never got too excited. Um, and there was a hostile audience, and uh, it's the, the hostile audience is the one that's depicted here. And they would, within seconds, start ignoring the speaker, they would turn their backs, talk amongst themselves, fall asleep or make you know, openly hostile comments 
Um, now, what you see from the image here is, first of all, that you know because this was created 12 years ago, the character models are very, very simple. Um, low polygon count and a very blocky appearance. Um, as well as this, all the animations in this were done by hand. Um, we didn't have motion capture um, and there's no lip syncing. So even with these limitations, we had a very powerful response to this simulation. Um, people who were exposed to the positive and the neutral audiences were able to deliver their speeches with much, much greater confidence than those exposed to the negative audience. Um, those who experienced the negative audience tended to become increasingly agitated as the simulation went on, and some of them weren't able, even able to finish. Um, so it's surprising because it comes back to they were in the cave, they're in a room, there's nothing actually there. Um, and even these very cartoonish looking characters turning their backs on people uh, was a huge uh, inhibition to people being able to carry on with their speeches. Um, so we were obviously very happy with the strong response that the simulation elicited, but it did raise the question, why do people respond so strongly to characters that aren't real and that don't even look very realistic? And uh, I think part of the reason for this can be found with the, the idea of the uncanny valley. Um, so this may be familiar to some. Uh, the uncanny valley is a term that has its roots in the Freudian concept of the, of the uncanny, but it was it became popular with a, a roboticist called Masahiro Mori. Uh, we used it to describe how robots uh, he was referring to, but it applies equally to avatars or virtual characters. Um, but he described how as they become increasingly visually realistic, then any flaws or unnatural elements of their movements or behavior will seem um, more repulsive rather than empathic, much more so than would be the case if they were less visually realistic. So you can see there are two graphs here, one for moving characters and one for still images or still characters. Um, as the realism increases, so does, well, the graph says familiarity, but this is our, our kind of uh, engagement with them as, as uh, uh, an empathic other person. Um, the realism increases, but as you get to something that looks fairly realistic, you get the sudden drop off and the things start to look creepy. Um, and this is an important point when you have available to you visually realistic characters. If you have a visually realistic character, you have to have um, behavior that supports this, otherwise they do look a bit like an animated corpse. Um, so this hypothesis, the Uncanny Valley hypothesis, is not something that's particularly provable and it is quite controversial. I mean, you can, on the other hand, argue that it's not really possible to produce some rigorous mapping between visual realism and behavioral realism. But uh, when you look at the, the, the response to Peter public speaking, this, this could help explain how the hand-animated, often quite unnatural movements of the virtual characters in Peter public speaking are to some degree masked by their cartoonish appearance. So the fact that they are of lower visual quality means that you can get away with a lot more in terms of their behavior. Um, more recently, um, we've got you know, improved rendering capability and better software. We're now able to produce characters that are not only more visually realistic, but we can animate them more naturally with motion capture systems. Um, I've got a short video here. I'm not sure how well this is going to play on this system, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, 
And what I just want to show here is that if you really want to strip down a representation of a virtual character, well, just display it as a collection of motion capture markers. So there, there are two characters in this clip, each represented by 32 markers. Now, you can possibly, given that I've told you there are two characters, you can probably figure out where arms, knees, feet, head are for each of them. But really, they don't look like much until you start animating them. Let's see if this can work. So as soon as they start moving, they become altogether more human than they were before uh, when they were displayed as a static image. Um, in fact, you can strip these down even further. We've, we've done some studies um, where we looked at professional dancers and we represented them with only six markers. Um, but the, the, the grace of their movements is still conveyed just with, with the six markers. Um, so naturalistic animation is a very key element. Um, it allows the expression of very subtle gestures. Uh, in fact, what we found with motion capture, well, a very crucial use of motion capture, is in animating characters that aren't doing anything. So if we want a character that's walking down a corridor, you're, you, you can quite easily use 3D Studio Max footsteps and it will look pretty good. But if you have a character that's not doing anything, um, it's very hard to animate them. They'll look unnatural if they're completely frozen, um, but it's very, very hard to hand animate the very small movements that are associated with just breathing and the slight shifts in posture that we all make when we're standing or sitting still. So motion capture is actually great for that kind of thing. And, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time capturing people standing still or sitting still. Um, and you come around now to the, the idea of using virtual characters to study real human behavior. Uh, this is something we've been involved in more recently. Um, and one example is something that's called the bystander experiment, which is a, this is a recently completed project. And it was a collaboration with social psychologists to study how people respond to violent emergencies. Uh, sorry, I meant to move on. OK. Um, so this is an image from one of the, the earlier simulations. Um, there are three characters here. The one on the left is a real person um, uh, playing the part of a participant. And uh, I should maybe explain what the, the, the bystander phenomenon is first. This is something that's been of interest to social psychologists for uh, 40 odd years, but is, is not very well explained. And the phenomenon is roughly that if we're alone in a public place, if we're walking down the street, maybe by ourselves, maybe we're just a friend, and we see a violent emergency, so maybe two people fighting or somebody getting beaten up or a domestic argument or something like this, there's a fair chance that we might intervene and try and stop it. Yeah. Um, however, uh, and there's lots of evidence for this, if an incident like this occurs in a busy street, with many, many people around to witness it, it is more likely that no one will do anything than if there's just a few people present. Um, and this seems very counterintuitive. It's a general observation since you know, people have very different personalities and individual responses to things like this are, uh, vary widely. Um, there are some proposed explanations for the bystander effect. These in might be diffusion of responsibility, you know, because nobody else is doing anything, you don't do anything, or people just not wanting to make a fool of themselves in public. Um, the problem that the social psychologists have is that they have no experimental means of studying this. Uh, it's not feasible to set up an experiment with two actors pretending to fight each other. Um, for one, you will never get ethical permission to do that. 
and for another, they're, they're not going to be able to replicate the scenario many times. Uh, so the, the kind of tools that social psychologists have relied on are videos of incidents and questionnaire-based studies. Um, but the, the problem with questionnaire-based studies, of course, is people don't answer accurately. What people say they might do in a situation is not the same as what they will actually do when confronted with that situation. So um, our approach was to make, create an incident that would happen in uh, an immersive VR setting. So we can repeat the same scenario over and over again. Uh, it's very different from using video or desktop system because you're confronted with life-size characters who, who get into a violent argument. Uh, and where we did it, uh, this is maybe a very British thing to do, um, the study takes place in a bar um, and the virtual characters involved are football supporters. But crucially what we did is we recruited football supporters to, to take part in it. Um, and each participant would initially be approached by a football supporter with the same affiliation as them, somebody who supported the same team as them, and would start a conversation about their football team. And then sometime later, another character, so this is the, the one in the white shirt, would enter the scene and start bullying the first one. And uh, as the bullying progressively gets worse and becomes physical, we would look at how the participant responded. Um, and what we found is the majority of participants try to intervene in some way. They would either physically try and step between them, or they would say something to the bully, or some of them you know, would try and get the, the, the victim to walk away from the, the, the scene. Um, what's important here, and what all our results are contingent on, is that um, we need to know that people are responding the same way to this virtual scenario as they would in a real situation. Um, so, to because otherwise any data we get is, you know, very questionable validity. Um, so to address these questions of validity, we, we did perform a few prior studies observing behavior in different social situations. This one wasn't the very first one we've done. Um, and uh, we've, we've gathered evidence that way. But also in the study itself, we inserted some control conditions that would check how responses of our participants matched some real world data that we had. So one thing we looked at were in-group, out-group phenomena. Uh, so we would have a control condition where instead of being a supporter of the, the same team as the participant, the victim might be just a generic football supporter. They would come in they would be wearing an unbranded sports shirt. So you can see the victim here is wearing a, a, a football shirt for one of the London teams. Um, they would say they would wear a generic shirt. And what we found was that um, while still most participants intervened in this instant, significantly fewer did. Now, this is not a surprising result in itself. Um, since it corresponds closely to data gathered from other studies on group affiliation and intervention in violent emergencies. Um, but what it did do is it, it, it validated to some extent that people were behaving to some degree as they do in the real world. Um, so as I was saying, this uh, study was completed recently. We're still processing a lot of the data from it. Um, but this ability to perform social psychology experiments in virtual reality opens some very interesting possibilities um, for cave-based research. Um, I think I've used up my hour. Um, and just quickly summarize, I've taken you in a bit of a, a tour of some of our research uh, and tried to relate it to the ideas of spatial and social cognition. Um, we at UCL, we are a, a large group of academics and researchers, um, and uh, uh, we, we do have a, a broad range of expertise that goes you know, across and beyond some of the topics described today. 